Welcome to the StateDefenseForce.com podcast. My name is Justin Stanton, and I'm a sergeant with the Texas State Guard. Today on the Commander's Brief, I'll be speaking with Major General Jay Kogan about the State Guard Association of the United States. Former five-star General Eisenhower wrote a letter to Congress. I therefore recommend that Congress enact legislation. Nationally, State Defense Forces are on, on the rise. There's no question about it. I feel warmer and closer to the country by going on StateDefenseForce.com, to be honest with you. This episode is sponsored by State Defense Supply. State Defense Supply is the one-stop shop for mission-ready uniforms and equipment. StateDefenseSupply.com. We know service. Major General Kogan is the commander of the California State Guard and the current president of SAUGUS, the State Guard Association of the United States. And I'm honored to have him as our guest. Good morning, General Kogan. Good morning. How are you today? I'm doing very well. Thank you. And how's the uh, weather there in Texas? Is the snow melted yet, I hope? <laughs> it has melted. Actually, we are up to uh, 64 degrees outside and sunny. <laughs> then that was a true aberration then, wasn't it? <laughs> it? It was. It was. Well, sir, what I want to talk about is SAUGUS, the State Guard Association of the U.S. But before we get into that, I want to get into a little bit of your background. It sounds like you've led a really diverse life, and there are things that are not in your biography that I've also heard about you. So I want to confirm some of those rumors as well, if Uh-oh. we can. <laughs> what is your current assignment? Well, I'm the commanding uh, general of the California State Guard, uh, but that's my job uh, right now and has been for at least three years in May, actually. Okay. In addition to that, are you still the chief counsel for cyber operations for the California yes, military department? Yes, I am. And that, that comes from my days as a JAG. You grew up in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Yep. Uh, after graduating from high school, you went on to the University of Connecticut, uh, but you left in 1967 and enlisted in the U.S. Navy. Yeah, I was one of those kids that went off to college, thought it was what I wanted and realized I wasn't happy there. And, uh, And so I left. And of course, in those days, it was the draft. It was even before the lottery system. I was immediately, you know, 1A. And I said, okay, I'm going to go anyway. And so I thought I'd join the Navy. My thought was, if I join the Navy, I probably won't get to Vietnam. And of course, as soon as I get to boot camp and they're looking for jobs, when they said, does anybody want to volunteer for flight? I said, I'll volunteer and end up spending 18 months in country. So, you know, my, never on a ship. I mean, I was in the Navy and I was never on a ship. It was P2s, patrol aircraft, did three rotations, six months each. We flew in and out of Cameron Bay. Sort of the tail wagged the dog. The reason I joined the Navy didn't become the reason why I was in the Navy, I guess is the best way to put it. So you came back from Vietnam and went back to University of Connecticut? No, University of Bridgeport, actually, uh, from my hometown. At that point, I think I was, at, at, after four years gone, I wanted to stay closer to home. And I kind of wanted to be home, see my folks and my friends. And so I said, I'll go to the college near me. So you graduated from University of Bridgeport, yeah. and then you went to California to go to law school. I sure did. What law school did you go to? Southwestern, down in L.A. It was one of those, it was a funny story. I, my GI Bill was done. I was kind of broke. I, I had a family member who said, if you come to Los Angeles in California, i got a place for you to live. And so I picked up, um, you know, Barron's because I wanted an ABA credit at law school so I could go back to Connecticut, I thought at the time. And there were five schools. Um, UCLA, I wasn't a state resident. There was no way I was going to get in there. USC was so expensive. If you're broke, that's not where you apply to law school. There was Pepperdine, which no one in the East Coast had ever heard of. Sounded like a table condiment. That left, that left two ABA schools, um, Southwestern and Loyola. Southwestern sounded like Northwestern. So that's how I chose my law school. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. That's where I went to law school. So because for financial reasons, it was cheaper to come to LA. But I stayed. And you started a law practice? I did. I did. In 1979. And what was your major area of focus for, uh, in your practice? Uh, predominantly trial law, all civil litigation, I would say. I did the only criminal I did, I defended some white collar federal crimes around the country. I was licensed California, New York, in the District of Columbia. I had offices in LA and Century City and in Manhattan, and I would go back and forth. But it was pretty much um, all uh, civil litigation with an emphasis in intellectual property. I did a lot of music litigation. Represented a lot of people, I'm sure your audience would know. One little factoid that's not in your biography is that you actually produced Requiem for a Heavyweight on Broadway. Yeah, 19, I think it was 83 or something like that. A few friends and I got together. It was really interesting because we we had to get Carol Serling, Rod's widow at that time, to get on board with this. We wanted to do it. It had only been done as a teleplay with Jack Polanski in the 50s and the movie with... Um, 
Jackie Gleason and Anthony Quinn, who played the character, and we wanted to get to Broadway. And we, so we went to Carol's house. Can you imagine holding up the original script typed by Rod Serling with his coffee stains and cigarette burns on the paper? It was almost chilling in a way. I mean, it, it was really fascinating. Yeah, we did it. And we did it out of town originally in New Haven with um, uh, Richard Dreyfus and uh, John Lithgow. And then we moved to Broadway and eventually uh, we had to replace Dreyfus. And, but yeah, it was kind of fun to do something like that. It was interesting. Yeah. That's really that's really neat. At what point in your career did you return to military service? Around 2006 or seven, I believe it was about 15, 16 years ago is when I did it. And I really wanted to pay back. And it was kind of interesting. I was looking for some way to do it. And I made a conscious decision. There are a lot of veterans organizations, you know, legal institutes, service organizations that will help veterans, but there aren't as many organizations that help the currently serving individual, the currently serving military person that is there to help them legally. They're used to going to their JAG officers. And as I'm sure you all know, their judge advocates have very limited capabilities. I mean, they're stuck under federal laws to what they can do in representing soldiers. So I went around looking for a place where I could use my years of experience at that point in helping soldiers and airmen and, um, I found the California State Military Reserve at the time before we changed our name. And they had a JAG Corps. And uh, from what I read, it looked like a good place to help people that were currently deploying. And so I joined for that sole purpose alone. And it sort of, I loved it. It, it, it drove, it actually is what drove me out of law is by joining it. I, I started realizing that there was a lot of need. Deploying soldiers were, you know, have all sorts of rights of deferring loans and mortgages, non, non-repossessions. You know, there, there's all sorts of benefits under the Servicemen Civil Relief Act and USERRA for employment purposes when you return. And it was amazing I found how many service members were quite frankly getting screwed by lenders and landlords and employers because they went off and defended their country. And I convinced the then staff judge advocate there was no prohibition against the State Guard JAG Corps actually representing soldiers in court for free. Because if you work for the governor, he can send his attorneys general into courts in suits. He can send State Guard JAGs in the court in uniform. There's no there's no literally prohibition against it. And they did it as a test case. And I and I started suing some banks for wrongful foreclosures. And it became kind of the norm um, in California. And I remember one day I had. Uh, after about doing this for three years or so, I think I was a major at the time, I had stopped a foreclosure on a soldier that was then deployed into the Middle East in combat. This is years ago. He sent me an email, and I'll never forget it. It, it basically said, Major Kogan, I, I don't know how to thank you. My, my family, I know they're now safe. They're not going to be on the streets. God bless you, and I will keep my head down and come home safe because of this. I won't worry about them. I started tearing up. In fact, I'm getting a little misty right now. I mean, I could not believe it. And it was literally better than any check any client had ever written me. And within nine months, I had left the private practice of law and got a full-time state active duty job as a judge advocate with the California Military Department to do this all the time. Uh, I went from making seven figures to making $65,000 a year overnight and never looked back. Um, And we have now in California have probably have the most robust legal assistance in the country because we will go to court. We have gotten soldiers free homes. We have stopped foreclosures, repossessions. We have got their jobs back. We literally, if it's related to their military service, uh, USERA, SCRA, California's Military and Veterans Code, any protections, um, if there's a problem, we have like 65 lawyers, JAGs in California and the State Guard from some of the big, biggest national and international law firms will literally represent these people and just blow everything out of the water because it's more experience than you can get in a normal judge advocate in the Army. I know that was a long answer, but I think it, it really describes why some people do this and stay. You find a purpose, and I found a purpose in that. So you transitioned at some point to a role in cyber operations. 
Yeah, yeah. I was sitting, I was, I was probably, I think I was a lieutenant colonel, and I was sitting around in the Staff Judge Advocates Office up in headquarters in Sacramento. And it was the first time that the military department was going to be asked to start doing a health assessments, penetration testings, and other assessments of state agencies. And so the the, the lieutenant colonel from the uh, Cyber Network Defense Team came down and says, we need a JAG to start doing these, you know, contracts and agreements and MOUs and MOAs with state agencies. And so I think I was half asleep, and the SJ said, does anybody here have any background? I thought he said IP, because I did all that intellectual property. I said, sure, I'll do it. He says, okay, great, you're the cyber jag. And then I found that he, he really meant IT, information technology. And I often joke, because at my age, I'm 72 now, I can hardly turn a computer on. And if you look in the dictionary for the definition of irony, it's J. Kogan, Chief Counsel, Cyber Operations. But I quickly learned that that was not the job. They got I have a TS, SCI clearance. Um, I've been, you know, I go back to Cyber Command. I've been back to the Pentagon, to NGB. A year and a half ago, I remember sitting in a room at Scott Air Force Base at Transcom with with only general officers from every service. Uh, And General Nakasone came down too, and, you know, the four-star head of uh, NSA and Cyber Command and the the four-star from uh, Transcom was there. And I'm sitting in this classified environment and I'm wearing California in uniform and nobody cared. The reality is if you've got something to offer, they don't care if uniform says U.S. Army, U.S. Air Force or California or South Carolina or Texas, they want your talent. And that is actually in my mind, the future of state guards is is to realize how many great things we have to offer to this nation through our respective military departments. And when you offer something and you produce, nobody cares. That's why state guards are on the rise right now, is they're finding throughout the country, Texas especially, South Carolina, I mean, all the states, uh, New York, people are on mission today, is that when we were asked to step up around the country, we all stepped up, did the job, no mistakes, no errors, no embarrassments, and we did the mission, and we did it well. And so now they're realizing, look at this great force we have. Let's tap into it. So it's the same story. If you have something to offer and you do it well, they're going to want you whatever your whatever your uniform says. And I think that's why state defense forces are on the rise right now because they finally realized that because we produced when they asked me, I was sitting with the general the other day. We were, we're standing up in California, a, um, a fixed point armed security force, 120 persons. Cause you know, I've got like between 12 and 1300 people right now in the California state guard. We're adding a whole bunch more, which I'll describe later in the conversation about our new missions. But one of them was that, and so I'm talking, and so we get the same old story. Someone says, well, what do we arm you guys? Well, how do you feel about that? I mean, do we feel comfortable in arming you as a state defense force? And and I looked at this one-star Army general, and I said, well, let me ask you a question. Who would you want to give it, rather give an M4 to? An 18-year-old with an 18-year-old brain you know, that really thinks not with an adult brain that just got a you know basic, has never fired a weapon until he got him basic, is put on the streets in civil unrest with an 18 year old brain or a 40 or 45 year old that's prior service and firing weapons all his life and has an adult brain. And they looked at me and they go, wow, I never thought about it that way. But that's what I mean. It's 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 an educational process, but it requires us to basically look at ourselves and, and acknowledge how great we really are and what we have to offer. And I think that's a great point to segue into the State Guard Association of the U.S., Saugus. Sure. When did you become president of the association? Uh, December 2019. Um, my term would have ended this year, but because of the um, of COVID and the lack of a, uh, a conference, and other things. I've been extended till September, at which point there should be a conference and a meeting, and uh, I will be replaced based upon vote at that point in time. Can you briefly explain the mission of the State Guard Association for us? I can tell you what it's not, and that is it's not Nargis. And people think often that we might be the equivalent of Nargis, and, and, and let me explain what that means. Nargis being the National Guard Association. National Association of the United States. They do do a lot of political lobbying. But think about it. They only have one place to lobby. That's called Congress. You know, they they do work on trying to improve legislation at a federal level. I've got 54 states and territories with their own individual legislatures, their own tags, 
their own governors. How does one organization capable of doing a national lobbying when there's 54 places to go to? And each of them have their own perceptions and visions. But what we can do in Saugus is help and aid each state that is trying to improve its position within that state. So where Saugus will come into play, unlike Naugus, where we will come into play as a stake art association, if you are trying to get newer legislation in your state, we will help show you how to get in that way. Or if you are a state that is wants to come back online, and we can talk about the, the state of the state, for want of a better phrase, where, where state guards are right now in a moment, I think it's probably a good place to do that is um, we will help you stand back up again. We will, sh- we will give you what you need. We will help you uh, enter dialogues um, on, on how to get your tags uh, to want to do it. I mean, there's only 19 states, nine, excuse me, 19 state defense forces out of 54 states and territories right now that are active. But that being said, I got a call from a Brigadier General in the Florida National Guard two weeks ago. They're ready to stand back up again. And I've been doing a data dump with him and telling him how to do it. Massachusetts, I know, is just going back online. Arizona has uh, sent some feelers out. Nationally, state defense forces are on, on the rise. There's no question about it. Yeah, I've talked to a few folks around the country recently from a couple of states, Idaho and Minnesota being two of them, that are trying a grassroots approach to trying to stand up a state defense force. The problem you have with that, and uh, you you don't mind me being frank, the word militia has become a pejorative word. To identify yourself as a militia, you have images of Proud Boys, you have images of people storming the Capitol, people going in Michigan trying to get the governor, and that is the press that it gets. I, I hardly ever refer to us as a militia, even though by law, um, I mean, if you look in California law, the act of militia in the state of California is defined as the National Guard and State Guard. I mean, we are the act of militia, uh, which is an interesting conversation. Many people don't realize that when the National Guard is in command control to the governor, the commission, if you're an officer that is being utilized, is the exact same commission. You get state commissions and federal commissions, a period. I mean, there's no difference in command and control to a governor. You know, I, over, as a JAG over the years, I, I briefed probably 15,000 soldiers on the way out to the Middle East on the law of war, rules of engagement. It was something I did all the time as a JAG. Um, and I'd joke, I'd get a battalion of soldiers in the room and I'd say to them, OK, all National Guard. I'd say, so if the president of the United States, the secretary of defense and the chief of staff of the army all walked in the room right now and gave you a direct order, forgetting protocol for a moment. What would your proper answer be? Excuse me, I'll check with my boss. You can't give me an order. And that happens to be true. Now, the president knows how to do it. He grabs them and federalizes them. And then the governor can't give him an order. And then the adjutant general can't give an order. I mean, that's the schizophrenia of the way the National Guard works in a way. But that concept of equality, I think, is also what's driving changes. Um, in reality, in reality, there's no distinction. My commission in California is the same as the state commission of my agent in general. While a Title 32 force is a command of the governor, a state guard officer could command it. There's no prohibition. In California, for two years, the commander of the Army National Guard in California, MRD, as a two-star federal general, Um, And they weren't ready to replace him at that point in time. So for two years, he put California on and commanded the Army National Guard, which is, you know, like 14,000 people in California wearing as part of the state guard. There were only some things he couldn't do. He couldn't sign certain fiscal federal documents that required a federal signature. But beyond that, command and control is what matters. And that's, again, that whole idea of learning who you really are. And, and, and understanding what, what power you really do have. That really changes the perception from, oh, you're just a volunteer. Well, I, I'm a volunteer who raised my hand the same way the guy in the National Guard standing yeah, next to me. Everybody's a volunteer. We don't have a draft anymore. There are, I mean, there is nobody that is not a volunteer. Pay does not control. Perfect example, we, we've looked at various things in California. We, we're, we're, we're very forward thinkers in a way. We look for things. How do we get authorities to do something? OK, how do you get there from here? And it's amazing if you just look at it, what you can do. And what I mean is if everybody's a volunteer, like pay is not a requirement even to be in the, in the USAR. There are people in the Army Reserves that will work for points, not pay. They'll drill for points. 
they're not getting a paycheck even. They're, so the reality is if you're a state employee, there's no requirement that you actually be paid to be a state employee. So, I mean, it, you know, it, when you think about it, there, the definition of what makes you something is not always the check. So if you take and you eliminate the check from the whole concept, what's the difference between you and somebody getting paid on Title 32 on a drill weekend? None. Zero. So to recap real quick, uh, Saugus's primary mission is to advocate for state defense forces in their states, their state legislatures. Is that? It's the, uh, yeah, it's to educate, facilitate the growth of state defense forces. And then its, it's second mission really is more trying to develop a national trade doc and central uh, repository for documents to help each other. We're starting to talk more to each other. I've, I've started having regular comms with my fellow commanders around the country. We email each other. A uh, perfect example was physical fitness, you know, for missions. Uh, in California, we now went out on the fire lines this last year. First time ever. I mean, we were out literally fighting fire. In fact, on several occasions, it was NCOIC's mistake guard that were commanding fire units of the National Guard. They were the NCOICs. As an example of who can command, an NCOIC from the State Guard was actually the leader of a fire crew made up of the rest of the National Guard. It's based on your talent and your capabilities. But the reality is, is I can't stick people out on a fire line that have medical issues. That would be negligence on my part. So we created a separate um, physical fitness test for them. It was a hybrid of the Air, of Air National Guard, of Air Force physical fitness, but stronger than even the United States Forest Service. We made them run with backpacks, not just walk with them. But it made me realize that every state is looking at their physical requirements differently. So I've asked how to share each other. Why keep reinventing the wheel is what I'm trying to say. And so we've started sending each other our, our, our stuff. Like I just got in, what is Georgia doing for physical fitness? What is Texas doing? I'm sending them what we're doing. And we're picking and choosing from each other to find the best solutions because the other states have some better practices than we're doing and I want to copy them. And if I have something to offer them, you know, I want to give them. I mean, if you don't mind me digressing a moment on why no, I see state guards being the future, in 1940, Congress passed a law that effectively authorized the state defense forces. It was anticipation of World War II. The theory being is that the federal government, the National Guard, was now going to have to go to war. So the federal troops were going to be gone. Who's going to take care of the states? So it authorized a stand up in these state defense forces. Uh, In fact, you will find it was funny when uh, I never realized that I was sitting there last January in Texas at a banquet with General Bodish, your commanding general. And they were talking about how next January being January 2021 was going to be their 80th birthday. They were going to have a big party and the governor was going to come. I'm going 80th birthday. When's ours? And I and I'm texting my historian from Austin, Texas, back to California. Dan Sebi, Dan, when's our anniversary? He goes, January 2nd, 1941. I go, you mean it's our 80th? He goes, yeah. It turns out every state that had them has the same anniversary. Our general order number one standing up the California State Guard was January, it was January 2nd, 1941. Now, that didn't mean they didn't exist in other forms before that, but that was really the closest to the modern version of a state guard, the home guard. And states all put them out. I mean, they had them. They needed to defend critical infrastructure, uh, do what it was necessary while the National Guard was gone. That was because the federal mission required the National Guard to go. Then Korea came again, and we were all renewed for two years. The law expired, renewed for two years. It then expired post-Korea. And and, and in 1955, I want to read you something. Uh, Congress was debating whether to re-stand up the state defense forces again. And General Eisenhower, then President Eisenhower, former five-star General Eisenhower, wrote a letter to Congress. And I'm going to read the letter he wrote to Congress. It's one paragraph, if you don't mind. He said, existing law does not permit states to main troops in addition to the National Guard. In view of the fact that the potential enemy possesses weapons of mass destructions and means for their delivery, it is a matter of urgent importance that there be no break between the time the National Guard units might be called into federal service and the time the states could raise additional forces to replace them. I therefore recommend that Congress enact legislation which permit the states to raise and maintain in time of peace organized militia forces, which would take over the National Guard's domestic missions and support civil defense activities upon withdrawal. How many of the audience out there have ever heard that statement? Probably very few. 
I've never heard it. Okay. That was a year later, it was 32 USC 109. That was the result of this, uh, uh, the testimony in Congress and the need and the recognition of that. And that is Eisenhower, as president in general, realizing how great the need is for us. And that was 32 USC 109, which is what controls us now, which is what Saugus supports. We will only support those state defense forces that are stood up pursuant to 32 USC 109 in command and control to their tag and their government, the organized militia. It goes back to an earlier conversation of that the problem with standing up a lot of these states is that there's so many unorganized militias out there that it's hard to almost separate skin from flesh sometimes and get to a state and have the state acknowledge I can have a command and control organized militia that is different from the Yahoos. Okay. I mean, I have found there's three reasons people basically join state guards. One, you've either been in uniform before and you kind of miss it and you want to come back to it, or you never were in uniform and you always regretted it and you want to do good and you want to join the camaraderie that comes to being in uniform. Um, You didn't do it for a million reasons starting a career, raising a family. I mean, a lot of really good reasons why people don't go into the military. And then there's the ones that will just want to play army and carry a a 50 caliber or a saw or something. I don't want those. Doesn't mean I won't give them a weapon, but that can't be the reason why they're joining. Because those are the the people that are going to give us the bad rep. When Congress passed 32 USC 109 in 56, all the states were authorized. All the states have laws on their books. Do you think they all stood them up again? No. A lot of states stood, stood them down again. Idaho did have one. Utah, they stood theirs down. Missouri has now stood it down. It's being careful to make sure that Saugus only supports those organizations that either are or will be properly recognized 32 USC 109 forces. But going back to the little vignette I was trying to say, so if you think about it, since 9-11, you know, Congress and its infinite wisdom no longer wants to spend the money to maintain the large active component we used to have. So what is it? The active component, I'm going to just estimate, it's about a million people amongst all the services put together right now. They now have learned to rely upon the reserve components, National Guard and Reserves. Most people don't realize that over um, somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of all deployed service members since 9-11 have been Guard and Reserve. It's not active. You've got more Guard people on multiple rotations because people that join the Guard try to stay for a lot of years. And then they may deploy, but they're still in the Guard to deploy again. A lot of active people get out after three years, five years, six years. There are people in the National Guard around this country who've got way more deployments than some of the people in the active components. So what did that do? If you look at Army Times just last month, there was an article that the call up of National Guard last year was the greatest since World War II. Army Times article last month, and they expect it not to change. So what you have now is for the first time, if you think about it, the genesis of 1940 and Eisenhower's comments in 1955, the federal needs can be so huge and the need for the National Guard so huge who is going to replace them? Who is going to do the DISC missions, the state missions? Well, for the first time since the end of those wars, the federal and state missions are slamming into each other. Who is going to do that? Who is it? I was talking yesterday to another general in the Guard. I said, look, it. last summer with all the fires in California and the civil unrest, how many IDT drill weeking days did you miss? How many AT days did you miss? What is your federal readiness? It's impacted by this. You're training. You're being paid by the federal government for war fighting, not for state defense. And so the answer is, well, why don't you start using your state guard more? Why don't you recognize that under command and control to your governor and your tag on state missions, we can take that pressure cooker off you. We can give you more time to, do, to complete your federal readiness. And it makes sense. And they realize that now. Why wouldn't we want to be a win-win, make the Pentagon happy and make our governor happy at the same time? So it's the acknowledgement that the federal mission is so great now, there is a greater need for the state guards to actually do these state missions, which is why by next summer, I will have at least two force packages. That's a force package is 100 people, and I'm, I'm looking for two. That's 200 new people for firefighting. The, and we're recruiting from volunteer fire departments, p- fire academies, places where people want to build their resumes up, learn how to actually firefight, get them red carded. 
And, you know, forever, Cal Fire every summer would say, why do we have to reinvent the wheel? The fires would start and they would call up the 40th Infantry Division or the 79th Infantry Brigade Combat Team, the 79th IBCT. And they'd have to spend five days at Camp Roberts training to go out on the fire line. Well, of course, because they're not drilling during the year learning how to fight fires, and nor do they stay as a cohesive fire team. Well, we're now going to red card our people being capable of going out on the fire line immediately. Why? Because we train for free. We can train all year round to be firefighters. You'll pay us when you use us on the fire line, like just like with the National Guard on their emergency state active duty. But we're ready to go like a hot shots, ready to go on a moment's notice. That's the future. That's what I'm trying to say. It's 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 acknowledging and recognizing and training everything we do in California now. And I believe in the other states, uh, as far as I can tell, every state is being really sharp on this. We're all training to the appropriate standards. We're all being qualified, certified so that when we tell our adjutant general who tells their governor or their office of emergency services, you know, their FEMA, you know, DHS state agency, we're qualified. We are qualified. Remember something, a mission comes from the state to the department. It doesn't go to the National Guard. Even in Texas, I mean, I'm assuming, I know in California that way, is your Office of Emergency Response or Services or Public Safety will issue a mission to the military department of your state, who then generally sends out the National Guard. But it doesn't mean they can't send out the State Guard. It's state funding based upon a state mission. And if you are qualified and certified, why wouldn't your military department use you as well as they would their National Guard? Because it's not an order you will send the National Guard out. It is you will sell out, send out personnel to respond to this emergency. In other words, there's no prohibition about using us. One of the things that I've seen as a member of Saugus and as a member of the Texas State Guard is that there's a growth happening in the State Guard Association training programs. Yes. Um, and it looks like, from my perspective, the end goal is a more homogenous standardized level of training, whether that's professional military education, your platoon leader course, your BNOC, your ANOC, your basic officer, advanced officers course. But you also have training programs for JAG, for medical, uh, for engineers, for chaplains. Is that in an effort to standardize a level of training so that every governor, every state defense force knows that, hey, they've been checked off uh, and and we have this level. We, we've set it's expectations. It's quite, quite enough of a baseline to say that you've been properly trained and educated and certified to do missions. Now, different states will have different requirements based upon the state requirement, meaning your OES requirements, your office of marine service, whatever it might be. So there may be additional training necessary where appropriate. But yeah, I mean, SAR teams, you know, we should all get SAR tech certified if possible. You know, I've just put together some SAR teams that are a combination of land. I took our cavalry and I repurposed them from ceremonial and stuck them out in backcountry horseback SAR. Uh, we've stood up our, our maritime component for water search and rescue, and we just bought our first drones. So we're going to put together a really composite ability to do search and rescue between horse, foot, drone, and water. But all the states are working. Look at Texas, your place. You guys are rescuing people all the time. I know Mississippi is. I know uh, it, it's it's universal. And then COVID, of course, proved how necessary we were. And our medical training teams at August are now putting together COVID templates, how to deal with that. But I, I know that every state has been online in, I think it was March or early April, early April, I sent out a survey to all the commanders. 16 states responded. And at that time of the 16 states, there were, there were 8,000 members collectively amongst those states that belonged to state defense forces. Of that, on that particular day, which was only a month into the COVID response, there were 1,200 state defense force people on, on orders on duty around the country, most being paid. That's, that was a snapshot in time of one day. That shows you how valuable we were. Now, think of the medical side of the equation. National Guard generally don't have medical commands. They have medical debts. They have all the 68 whiskeys in the world, all the, you know, the medics. How many of them have a lot of ICU nurses or technicians, x-ray technicians or pharmacists? I mean, those are the anomalies. Now, the Army Reserve and the active have tons of those. But you get to the guard, that's not really, it's hard to recruit at that level. So in our, right now in our state, and I know I was talking yesterday with Georgia and Tennessee and, and other states in New York, we're able to round out the MST, the medical support teams, because the National Guard does not have all the needed personnel. You fill them with state guard personnel to ensure there's complete MSTs out there. But that's what SOCUS can help do is create 
not only the shared training, but the shared knowledge of success. It's a lot easier to go to your tag and say, look what Texas is doing. Look what Georgia is doing. Look what you know South Carolina is doing. Look how successful they are in their MSTs. Uh, tag, don't you think you want to think doing that now? It's very successful. And Saugus becomes that not only training ground, because that's what it should be as a trade off, a centralized trade off for state guards, but it really is a information sharing network. It really should be a platform for the ability for all of us to hang our data in one place, share it with each other. There's no secrets here. It's it's how do we help each other improve? There's I'm learning all the time from my you know fellow uh, state guardsmen in other states, and I think sometimes they learn from me, and it just helps all of us. Do you think there's there's a future mission in state guards to go into other states and assist in other states? Sure, why not? Think of what an EMAC request is, emergency you know management assistance compact. I mean, all the states now you know belong to it. Katrina basically realized we all needed them. But why not? I mean, give me a reason why, because an EMAC request comes in to your OES, your emergency service office. They issue a mission to the national, to the, to the military department. Why not? If you can fill the, the gap, like our IC for your teams have been sent out of state a number of times, all the way back to Katrina. I mean, there's absolutely no reason why not in response to an EMAC request. I was talking actually with General Bodish at one time last year, I said, look, you guys have a maritime. I now have a maritime. If your flooding is so severe, send an EMAC request to California. We'll put our boats on a C-130. It's being paid for. We'll send them to California and vice versa. If we need help, we'll send them to you. I'm a paid member of the State Guard Association of the U.S. I have been since I joined the Texas State Guard eight years ago. We've gotten a lot of the big picture, how it benefits uh, the State Guards. What are the benefits to the individual soldier, to to the boots on the ground, for maintaining that paid membership? Well, because it's part of that whole national camaraderie. I think I think what it does is it makes you part of a greater whole. You know you belong to a, a national organization that has the same goals and purposes you do. It's the belief that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. You're part of something, and it also gives you access to all these training capabilities. As a member of Saugus, with your dues paid, it gives us the ability to integrate and interact with the states, help them to grow, help new states develop their state defense forces, which just makes the whole better than the sum of the parts. If you're a member of a, of a state defense force, why wouldn't you want to be a member of Saugus and feel part of the greater whole and help Saugus help you and the other states because you will be better if everybody grows? Yeah, absolutely. Is Saugus equivalent to the National Guard Bureau or closer to, to Nagus National Guard it's Association? Not National Guard Bureau. National Guard Bureau is is basically, if you think about it, it's a method for federal money to be spent on National Guards. It has the ability to issue policies and regulations that will control the utilization of federal equipment and money, quite frankly. It's closer to Nagus in the sense it, it it's a representative organization of a group of people with the same goals in mind. Okay. NGB does not represent the National Guard. It manages and controls much of the National Guard and how it and how it will operate through the power of the person, the power of equipment. Uh, so a perfect example is as the president of Saugus, Colonel D. Donato from South Carolina was interacting with Congressman Joe Wilson, who in 2011 had tried to amend 32 USC 109 to add different authorities for us. They got a hold of me and as president of Saugus, I actually just rewrote 32 USC 109. It has already been sent to DOD for comment. And hopefully we've got we've got a bunch of congressmen and a bunch of people working on uh, getting it into next year's NDAA. If we do that, I mean, what I'm trying to do is get 32 USC 109 to authorize this clear utilization of federal equipment mm. while performing service. Yeah, you understand that exists already. I mean, for those geeks out there, I mean, have I, have, I don't know how many of you read the Chief of National Guard Bureau instruction of 15 June 2017 to replace the old NGR 10-4. Uh, and, and if you read it, it authorizes that National Guard, it is National Guard policy. This is written, signed by General Engel, who was then Chief of National Guard Bureau, may interact with state defense forces to train and conduct exercises and maneuvers in support of domestic or civil support operations as appropriate. The National Guard will consider SDF as any other state entity with respect to preparation for and participation in domestic or civil support operations and the related use of federal equipment, with the exception of specific restrictions of 109. The answer is the authority already exists to utilize federal equipment while in support of the National Guard or federal missions, but that's a policy. 
And then you get the uh, National Guard Regulation 5-1, which authorizes state employees in support of the cooperative agreements to use federal equipment, you know, cars and vehicles and stuff. But these are policies and regulations. And there is concern if you use this as an Anti-Deficiency Act violation, a purpose violation. There's there's lots of insecurities on implementing it because even though the CNGBI was done, policies are never created to inter- to implement it. So for almost four years now, it's been legal to do this, but nobody created a policy. So my goal is to change the federal legislation, make it statutory that we can use it. Then there's no more you know, ambiguity anymore. You can do it. Also, why aren't state, to force, state defense forces eligible for federal surplus the same way a sheriff's department would be? Why not? That's what I've written into the new law. I don't know if it's going to be enacted, but that's what they're working on right now up in Congress, authorization to receive the surplus. And I did that from Saugus. That's what Saugus does. Not as the CG of California, but as the president of Saugus. I wrote it as a fiscally neutral bill. It costs the federal government nothing, but it gives us all the authorities. And that's what was very key and what we've needed. We needed, in my mind, federal legislation that gave us the authorities and access to equipment resources. And that's necessary. Or at least federal legislation that doesn't prohibit that authorization. That's correct. They're actually authorizing. Specifically says you may use, you may get, you may have, you may this. We will profit. We will process security clearances. We will do whatever it is. We will say, in other words, based upon the adjutant general's request. In other words, if the legislature goes, it's going to be contingent upon the adjutant general of the state to want to use this forces in that manner. And if he does, then he no longer has to worry about can I use what I have to support them. But that came from Saugus, not from not from me as a CG of California. So th- this is just a wild question to, to dovetail off that then. Would that open the door at some point for somebody like the California State Guard to say, OK, we're going to train helicopter pilots because now we can use National Guard helicopters? State Guard trains National Guard truck drivers. We do. Our small arms training team trains them to fire weapons. I mean, I, I don't know if I'll go so far as a helicopter, but the reality I mean, yeah. and, and I mean that from a practical sense. OK, of course, of course, there's a lot of you know certifications that require federal nexus to them. But the point point is, is at, at the end of the day, why not? Why, why would the federal government hire a contractor, give them a cat card as a contractor and let them train people, but not let a state defense force with the same qualified personnel, same backgrounds, not train people? Give me a reason why not, especially when a contractor has no UCMJ hanging over their head. Most states have adopted the UCMJ into their state laws. You're subject to them. I know I am. So the, the, re, the reality is, is I often, again, say that a lot of our problems arise out of education and perceptions. Our biggest, our biggest goal in Saugus, and it should be in each state, educate, educate, educate. So how does one become the president of Saugus? Uh, be either a current or past um, commanding general and a prior board member and vice president. It's, it's, it's by the bylaws. How long have you been involved with, with Saugus? Uh, personally, probably, uh, well, I like to say on and off because there's times I didn't pay my dues, but I do now. <laughs> since since I joined, you know, with MEMS years and years and years ago, um, when I first joined, obviously, because it was around and it was, it, I, and, 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 you know, I just joined and I was looking at the people with MEMS BAB and I said, what is that? And they explained it to me. I said, wow, I want one of those. You know, I, I, I want to learn. I want to be I want to be certified. I want to be qualified. I want to be a standout. I want to I want to show somebody that I have I, I've I've now earned something different from what I did in the past. So I fall under the classification two of the three different types of people that join a state defense force. I never served federal service. I got later in life and found the opportunity. And when I joined the Texas State Guard, while my application was in process, uh, I found the State Guard Association completely by accident on my own. And I thought, well, here's an organization I'm joining because I want to be a part of something. And this is a larger organization. And that's like, I think I paid my dues to Saugus before I ever swore into the Texas State Guard. Wow. Because I wanted to be a part of something. No, but and isn't that what I said earlier? Absolutely. It's part of a greater whole. It's it's the camaraderie that comes with the education that comes with the 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 belief that you are part of something bigger that has the same goals as you. I don't disagree. Does the State Guard Association have a fraternal component to it? In my mind, one of the things that's lacking from from the identity of a state defense force member is I'm a I'm a member of the Texas State Guard. Okay, well, that that has that builds camaraderie with other fellow members of the Texas State Guard. 
but that doesn't translate across the border to California necessarily. What I'd like to see is Saugus at some point get back into a national conference, annual conference. It does it. But I'd like to see more people show up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, in August, people come from all over the country to their annual conference. I, I mean, when Saugus does it, people do come from everywhere, but not in the numbers. Wouldn't it be great if we had, you know, a national conference? And um, and we are going to try that in California. We're, next September, we've reserved a hotel actually near Disneyland so that hopefully things are open. Um, people bring families and come. Mm-hmm. You know, spouses and kids have something to do at a conference. But, you know, Saugus does have their conference, you know, and training sessions. But I think I'd like to see it expand even broader into one where it could be more fraternal. People get to talk to each other, share ideas and, and comments at the grassroots level, at the enlisted level, the junior officer level, not just the CG level. Yeah, I mean, That would be great, but I don't know another way to do it fraternally other than that, other than continuous you know, interactions on, on social media platforms. I think I see a lot of what's going around the country looking at statedefenseforce.com, to be honest yeah. with you. I, I love being being a member and watching it, you know, and seeing what's going on uh, in Maryland and other states, whether, whether it's Barnes and his music, which I see all the time from Maryland or others. I mean, I love it. It's I feel warmer and closer to the country by going on statedefenseforce.com, to be honest with you. Who's posting on statedefenseforce.com? It's not just senior officers. Right, it's, right. It's junior enlisted, junior officers. It's people that have something to share about how proud they are of what they're doing in their state. And that's the only time I get to see it. Before the movie business, people in America didn't know what the America looked like, okay? If you lived in New England, you didn't know what people in the Southwest looked like. There were no movies. There was no television. The movies changed that. When they created the set in Hollywood that they filmed – Gotcha. That's what America saw as America. And they never had a perception of it before. That's the same thing the State Defense Force Com does. It gives me an image of what the rest of the country looks like that I would never have the ability to see otherwise. That is what that's why I, I watch it all the time. I have you know one of my groups, I follow it, I want to see what's going on. It gives me ideas. I can't tell you my ideas I've had for the California State Guard from watching what another state does, but it's I'm not gonna get the same data point from another commanding general right. as I will from an E4 somewhere who's posting and saying, look what I just did. I'm going, wow, why aren't we doing that? And the more that we talk in state guards, the more the hair will go up on people's arms when they hear stories about doing something that someone else did or I was there too. We need to develop more of that kind of thing within state guards where that recognition is there. We need to share our logos, our stories, our camaraderie, so that you're right. You're walking out of Disneyland, and I see someone that I know is in the Texas State Guard. I go, hey, I'm in the California State Guard. We're both State Defense Force members. We have a connection that people who aren't part of us don't have. Yeah. Well, sir, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to join us on the StateDefenseForce.com podcast. Our guest today has been Major General Jay Kogan, commander of the California State Guard uh, and also president of the State Guard Association of the U.S. Thank, thank you, you very so much, much, sir. Thank you for having me on the show. It's been a pleasure. Um, Any time that I have an opportunity to speak to my brothers and sisters in State Defense Forces around the country, then I'm a happy guy. Because the more we communicate, the better we are. And that that really is my personal belief on that. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. I really mean that. This episode is sponsored by State Defense Supply. State Defense Supply is the one-stop shop for mission-ready uniforms and equipment dedicated to supporting state defenders everywhere. Visit statedefensesupply.com for all your uniform needs. You can find and follow them on Facebook and Instagram for the latest coupons and specials at State Defense Supply. statedefensesupply.com. We know service. <laughs>